Aloha and welcome to our worship this morning, my friends. We're so glad that you can be with us and know that no matter who you are and where you are on your journey of life and of faith, you are so very, very welcome here. And we're glad that you can join us. Today, we are celebrating Holy Humor Sunday. Holy Humor Sunday comes out of a tradition that believes that God played the ultimate joke on the devil by raising Jesus from the, day, from the dead. And so on this Sunday, we celebrate with jokes, with practical jokes, and wearing funny and outlandish clothes. It's all about joy and laughter. And so I hope even watching at home online, you get into the spirit of this and enjoy it and have fun. If you have some jokes to share, type it into the comments. We would love to hear the jokes. Just make sure that they are appropriate. As we move into our time of worship, we do have some announcements to share. The first is a reminder that next Sunday, April 14th, will be my installation as senior minister here at Central Union Church. Our guest preacher that day will be John Pavlovitz, and we would love you to attend the service at 4 p.m., followed by a reception in the parish hall. We hope you will join us and celebrate this new thing that God is doing in this community and in all our lives. Also, on uh, April 14th, next Sunday, we will be having just one service in the morning at 10 a.m. in the sanctuary. That's to enable all our musicians and all those participating in the service to be able to participate in the installation service as well. So I hope you will join us for worship in the morning um, and join in worshiping God and celebrating God that day. And then finally, um, a major fundraiser for our Central Union Preschool is Dazzle. And tickets for that are now available. Um, and so I encourage you to buy your tickets and attend that event on April 26th. Um, and there will be more information on your screen and in the e-blast. Thank you. Now let us worship God. Friends, join me in our unison prayer of invocation. Pray with me. Laughing God, as you fill us with new life, may we delight in sharing it with others. As you tell us the good news which can never be taken from us, may we rejoice in offering it to the broken, the sad, the lonely. As you tickle us with your grace, may we give it away with laughter on our lips and joy in our hearts. God in community, holy in one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friends, allow your hearts and minds to be opened by the power of the Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed, you may hear with joy what God has to say to us this day. Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the, his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Hear what the Spirit is speaking to us today. Easter is a time of surprises. While worship has always been in a state of tension between our understanding of piety and the joy that fills the heart by hearing the good news, today to laugh or not to laugh becomes a question. To restate Shakespeare, whether it is nobler in the mind to control the impulse and maintain decorum or to give in and enjoy this day, is totally up to you. To begin, I thought I would share some light bulb, light bulb jokes to get us into the mood. So, how many Episcopalians does it take to change a light bulb? Eight. One to call the electrician and seven to say how much they like the old one better. Baptists? At least 15. One to change the light bulb and three committees to approve the change and decide who brings the potato salad. Quakers, you need 10 to sit around in a circle until one feels the inner light. United Church of Christ, undetermined. Whether your light is bright, dull, or completely out, you are loved. You can be a light bulb, a turnip bulb, or a tulip bulb. And then atheists, none. Atheists don't believe in light bulbs. And then Unitarians. We choose not to make a statement either in favor or against the, the need for a light bulb. However, if in your own journey you have found that light bulbs work for you, that is fine. You are invited to write a poem or compose a modern dance about your personal relation with your light bulb and present it next month at our annual Light Bulb Sunday service, in which we will explore a number of light bulb traditions, including incandescent, fluorescent, LED, long life, and tinted, all of which are equally valid paths to luminescence. Roman Catholics, none. Candles only. Evangelicals, evangelicals do not change light bulbs. They simply read out the instructions and hope that the light bulb will decide to change itself. And Congregationalists? Change! Easter is a time full of surprises. 
This second Sunday of Easter builds on the good news we celebrated last Sunday. Jesus was dead, now alive. And the women come to the tomb in despair, then leave the tomb in delight. It's quite a story. Lots of questions, but as we learned last week, the bottom line, what this season is all about, is that Christ is risen. And your response, he is risen indeed. And today, Holy Humor Sunday, continues in that celebration. It celebrates the fact that the resurrection of Jesus is God's ultimate joke on evil and death. It is a testament to the God who, as the psalmist says in the second chapter, fourth verse, sits in the heavens and laughs at the foolishness of humanity and any forces that might seek to thwart divine purposes. And in churches all around the world, the celebration has commenced. Each year, more and more congregations of all persuasions all over the United States and in far corners of the world are celebrating the Easter season in new and exciting ways. There is the Bavarian practice that has the faithful gathering back in church on Easter afternoon for a time of storytelling and practical joking. There is the early Orthodox tradition in the Easter Monday gatherings for stories, jokes, and anecdotes. And to this day in Slavic regions, Christians gather the day after Easter for folk dancing and feasting in the churchyard. It is variously known as Bright Monday, White Monday, Dingus Day, and Emmaus Day in one country or another. another. Latin speakers call it the Rhesus Pascalis, God's joke. Today, you and I call it Holy Humor Sunday, a time to laugh. While touring the Holy Land, two people thought they'd rent a boat and take it across the Sea of Galilee. That'll be $200, said the man at the boat rental. $200? That's an outrageous amount, one of the tourists exclaimed. Ah, but this is the lake that Jesus walked on, the merchant pointed out. To which the irritated tourist replied, well, for $200 a boat, I can see why. But as wonderful as last Sunday was, and how, as wonderful as it made us feel, especially after worship, time with family and friends and all that candy and chocolate, Monday dawned, and life was no longer flowers and fragrances. The world intruded again. There was news of the continuing instability in the Middle East, tornadoes and forest fires, drought and wars around the world, economic uncertainty and the poverty here and around the country. And we get to a point where it can feel so overwhelming. And so we have to just ignore all of it for our own mental health and our own peace of mind. All this following some of the best news that we will ever hear, that Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. It is no wonder to me then that the lectionary, which is the three-year cycle of scripture readings, which we and most mainline churches follow, offers us the same gospel lesson year after year after year on this Sunday after Easter. This is one of the incredibly rare times on the calendar of the liturgical year that you find the very same reading on the very same Sunday annually. The disciples, at least most of them, are in a locked room. Just think, plastic film, duct tape, deadbolts, locks, whatever it took. They were scared to death that the same fate that took their master on Calvary might be awaiting them as well. Yes, they had heard the story of the women about the empty tomb, but at this point, that is all they knew. It was a story. And suddenly, there is Jesus, through the plastic and the duct tape, saying shalom. Our scripture translates that as peace be with you. And that is legitimate. But it can just as legitimately be rendered, hi guys, or even some first century version of, what's up? More strictly translated, Jesus' peace be with you meant much more than our idea of peace. When the risen Christ said those words, it was more than just a greeting, more than just an announcement, literally translated, peace be with you is a pronouncement of well-being, of wholeness, of completeness. You know, I can relate to Thomas. I wonder, can you? 
while the other disciples are trying to convince Thomas that Jesus was alive and that he did appear to them and that all that they had seen with the daughter of Jairus and the son of the widow Nain and with Lazarus, how now come true for Jesus? It was just too much. Thomas couldn't believe it. He was devastated by what had happened in the past and would not admit to it. He had been there when Jesus was murdered upon that cross and his present faith, his present hope, his present direction had been shattered. And we label Thomas as doubting. But I tell you the truth, I would have been making the same demands that he did. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And no, no doubt there are people in our church pews around this community this morning who are in exactly the same boat as Thomas. Life has dealt some, some pretty crushing blows. In many ways, we may call ourselves Easter people, but I think we still feel like we're living in a Good Friday world. Perhaps like Thomas, we did not give ourselves a chance to get it. We were elsewhere. But now, we are all here. Thomas too, the friendly New Testament church where all are welcome. Right? The doors are locked again. Still on orange alert, just in case. And suddenly, Jesus, put your finger here, Thomas. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Start doubting and believe. But Thomas's experience didn't end there. When Jesus showed up on the scene and proclaimed, Peace be with you, it was that encounter with the risen Lord that empowered Thomas and the rest to publicly and powerfully proclaim the good news. The news that over time would turn the world upside down. With eyes that were no doubt as big as dinner plates, Thomas doesn't even bother to check before he responds, my Lord and my God. Now Thomas is in on the joke too. As the writer in Ecclesiastes has it, there's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. And we know what this is the time for. Now you may have heard this joke. An Episcopal bishop went to an unfamiliar church <coughs> to lead worship. And there was a microphone on the altar. And as he was uncertain whether it was switched on or not, he tapped it gently with no result. Then leaning very close to it, he said in a loud whisper, which echoed through the whole church, there is something wrong with this microphone. And the well-trained and responsive congregation, very familiar with the very latest in liturgical language, replied at once, and also with you. When Jesus said, peace be with you, he was giving Thomas, the disciples, and even us, the hope we so desperately need in our continuing journey with this living Christ. Hope that because he lives, we too will live. Hope in the future that people, events, or circumstances cannot change. Hope that says we don't have to live in our past, struggle in our present, or fear our future. It's a holy hope that says this Easter, when Jesus told us, peace be with you, it will make a difference. Life will not be the same. Like Thomas, may it mark our lives with a purpose, with meaning, and a new direction. It was a couple of weeks after the resurrection when someone approached Joseph of Arimathea, expressing their surprise at him, allowing Jesus to be buried in Joseph's newly hand-hewn stone tomb. Joseph simply shrugged his shoulders and said, he only needed it for the weekend. Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Easter is a time full of surprises. An empty tomb, a doubter's fears, and unbelief changed. A Savior announcing that his peace will be with us. So my friends, embrace the surprises. Embrace and enjoy the new life. Have faith, believe, laugh. And may Christ's peace be with you in this season and every day. Amen. Let us pray.
Friends, when I was growing up, my family was part of a large Presbyterian church where Pastor Dave Smazik, whom you might remember, uh, was the pastor. My very earliest memory of communion took place at that church with that community. I feel like I was pretty young, and I remember that Pastor Dave was standing up in front officiating communion. And at that time, we didn't have an associate minister with us, and so one of our deacons, we'll call him Jim, just in case he's watching today, Jim was standing with Pastor Dave to help serve communion. And I remember that Pastor Dave said the words of institution, and he prayed over the bread and over the cup, and of course, the Presbyterians are known as the frozen chosen. And so as he was doing this, it was very serious and everyone was silent and, and solemn. And then the deacons came forward and Pastor Dave and Jim began slowly handing out the communion elements. There were plates full of cut pieces of bread and, and others with tiny cups of juice for each person. Well, as they were slowly taking each plate off of the stack and handing it to the deacons, something went terribly wrong. I think Jim didn't get a good grip on one of the plates. And as he turned to hand off the plate, disaster struck. The plate of bread sort of launched out of his hand. It flew past the deacons and it hit the ground on the chancel further out. And then it started to roll. It rolled down the center aisle, spitting those small pieces of bread as it went. And everyone there sort of panicked and froze. They just kind of let it keep rolling and rolling down the aisle. It made it about halfway down the center aisle before it slowly clattered flat like a quarter does. I just remember being with my mom, and I was completely silent. Everyone was completely silent. You could have heard a pin drop as everyone just sort of stood in wide-eyed horror at what had happened. And then Pastor Dave burst out laughing. I mean belly laughing. And soon the congregation, we all laughed with him. And eventually the deacons started to laugh too. I will never forget that moment. I love that that's my very first memory of communion, that it was filled with laughter and with deep joy. To be honest, that just feels right to me. As people of faith, I sometimes think that we take ourselves a little bit too seriously, that we believe that in order for something to be meaningful or deep, it has to be serious. But I just don't think that that's true. Surely on the night when Jesus gathered with his disciples, when he taught us to celebrate communion, surely there was laughter shared that night. Surely there were stories told, and there was joy overflowing as friends shared a meal. At that table, I like to imagine that the disciples could come and just be themselves, that they could bring their whole selves there, the good, the bad, and the ugly that they could wear what they wanted, that they could say what they wanted, share their joys and hardships, that they could laugh at themselves. And I like to think that Jesus could do that too, that he could come and be himself fully. Because isn't that what being a community is all about? Isn't it about authenticity and vulnerability and acceptance and love? And isn't being a community of faith about bringing ourselves to one another vulner vulnerably and then coming before God authentically in worship together? That's what I am here for. Friends, this meal, this sacred meal of communion, is one tangible way that we can come before God together. Here at the communion table, we can be ourselves fully, here we can laugh and cry, we can yell, we can drop bread and watch it roll, because here at the communion table we are fully seen and fully known, we are fully loved. All are welcome at this table, you are welcome at this table, because Christ has invited you just as you are. So church, come, 
Come and eat. Come and meet the living Christ. Come and find community. Come and be healed. Come and laugh because of God's extravagant, outrageous, reckless love for us all. Friends, we remember that on the night on which he was to be betrayed, Jesus gathered around the table with his closest friends, his best friends. And they took bread and Christ blessed it. And after he blessed it, he broke it. And he passed it around saying, friends, take and eat this, each of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, after supper, Christ took the cup. And after giving thanks to God for it, he poured it and passed it and said, take and drink this, each of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, my life which is poured out for you and for the forgiveness of all of your sins. And Christ tells us that as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we do so in remembrance of him. Friends, join me in a spirit of prayer. O oh Lord, giver of joy and of laughter, we give you thanks. We thank you for opportunities to laugh at ourselves. We thank you for the laughter of friends and the belly laughs of children. We thank you for those people in our lives who love us because of our quirks and not just in spite of them. We give you thanks for the courage to smile even when difficulties arise in our lives and for those people who keep us hopeful even when things feel hopeless. We give you thanks for the saints that we know who overflow with laughter and who spread your contagious joy to all of us. Holy One, we thank you for the words of Christ, words that defy our logical minds, for teaching us that we can be born again, for the absurdity of a camel trying to fit through the eye of a needle, for the father of the prodigal son who is willing to look like a fool as he runs to greet his son, for tiny bits of faith that can move entire mountains. God of grace, we praise you for the great and nonsensical good news that the tomb is empty and that Christ is alive. For the good news that the last shall be first and that those who wish to become great must serve others. The news that the lost will be found and the small will become great, that captives will be freed and the powerful will be made weak, that the yoke of the oppressed will be broken that though you are wisdom, you choose not only to forgive us for our failings, but to empower us to be the ones who make this upside down kingdom of peace and hope, vulnerability and freedom a reality. O oh Lord, giver of joy and of laughter, we thank you for trusting us, calling us, and strengthening us for the journey. We ask your blessing on this sacred meal of grain and of grape, that through it you would empower us to be a people worthy of your calling. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, the one who taught us to pray together saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the body of Christ, the bread of life, broken for you and for all. Let us share. This is the cup of blessing, 
the cup of salvation, the cup of the new covenant. Let us share. Pray with me. God of laughter, thank you for meeting us at this table. Thank you for this reminder that you draw near to us, even in our weakness. Now send us out to be your people of hope, your people of courage, your people of freedom, who speak truth to power. We pray this in the precious and powerful name of Christ. Amen. God is the giver of all good things, the one who fashioned each of us with unique gifts that together make the body of Christ whole. In joy and in gratitude for all we have received, we offer our lives back to God. We share our time, our talent, and our treasure, and in so doing, we say yes to God's invitation to join in the work of building God's kingdom of love, joy, and peace. Our God is a God of laughter, God of joy. All that we can offer stems from God's generosity. May the gifts that we return to God become a blessing for our whole community, enriching and empowering us for the work to which we are called. My friends, the laughing one called us together so we could share in the laughter of life. And now the laughing one sends us out to carry the joy of life and love to the world. So go in laughter, go in peace, go in grace. Keep God's love in your heart and a smile on your face. And when you hear a good joke, remember that sharing is a great thing. So go in peace to love and to serve our living and loving God. Amen. Christ be served.